Welcome to the WOW Women podcast series, Success Circles. I'm Tracy Soffer, founder and CEO of WOW Women. Today, I'm speaking to the absolutely fabulous Marcus Pierce. Marcus is a journalist by profession who cut his teeth in radio and TV alongside Australia's biggest names in sports and show business. Today, Marcus is the founder of the Exceptional Life Blueprint and CEO of The Wellness Couch, which is Australia's number one health and fitness podcast network. His most popular podcast, which is 100 Not Out, comprises of hundreds of interviews with some of the world's happiest and longest lived people. Each year, Marcus travels to the small Greek island called Ikaria, known as the island where people forget to die. Extraordinary. In 2005, Ikaria was identified by National Geographic as a blue zone, also known as part of the world that experiences greater longevity than anywhere else in the planet. On this tiny island, they experience 25% less cancer, 50% less heart disease, and next to no dementia or mental health problems. And so they are some of the happiest people that you'll ever meet. Marcus grew up in Melbourne and today lives in Byron Bay with his wife, Sarah, and three soon-to-be four children. Welcome, Marcus. Thank you for being here today. Marcus Pierce, welcome to the WOW Women um, Success Circles podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us off the back of the WOW Women One Day event. And the feedback I've got from my audience is they just loved you. How do you feel about that? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to get complacent, Tracy. I appreciate the feedback. Um, it's always nice. Look, it's better to get that feedback than the opposite, isn't it? Um, but uh, look, feedback's an interesting one because you kind of you would you would like to think that the feedback will be positive. It's kind of we do what we do to hope that uh, it helps people. Um, but whenever I get asked about how do I feel about good feedback, I'm genuinely of the opinion that I don't want to listen to it too much because if you are you know, you're in business. If you listen to the ego strokes too much, then you can get complacent and then that can affect your performance. So as much as I love it, uh, it's more just a reminder that I'm on the right track and doing the right thing. Um, but I definitely don't, I definitely don't give myself a pat on the shoulder for it because um, I definitely don't want to impact my performance moving forward without wanting to put a downer on the feedback, Tracy. I don't want me to say it like that. But, no, um, not at all, Marcus, not at all. And it's great grounding from what I'm hearing you say. And I'm, and I try and listen more now that I've got a bit older rather than, um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying to listen and understand what you're saying to me. But from my perspective, you were the first male speaker that we had at the event, which was um, just added this incredible layer to, to the event and gave it such great depth and diversity. And um, and I know they're sort of bandied words now, but it really did. It, it, it created a, a, a beautiful overlay or an intertwining of um, the beauty part, the beautiful parts of men and women and how we come together and, and, and join as one to be able to empower and inspire each other on an event like this. So, so thank you for that. You were, you were amazing. Oh, my pleasure. No, I just think it is important. Um, there is a lot of, you know, female empowerment and then there's a lot of uh, men's uh, movements or male movements. And I feel like, yeah, often the missing link in a lot of those movements is the opposite. I think, you know, um, it's so, I think it's courageous of you that you had a male speaker at an event that was largely attended to by women. Um, so, and I grew up in a house full of girls. My mom and dad split up when I was 10 and uh, I have two beautiful sisters. And so I think I may have even said it on the day. I'm not quite sure, but I'm way more comfortable in a room full of women than a room full of men. Um, it's just always been my environment. My mum was such a social um, mom. She still is to this day, but we would always be out you know, catching up with her friends for coffee and cake and going over to their houses and doing all the rest of it. So I've always been very comfortable um, in the company of women and I even, uh, yeah, I was invited to do a talk on International Women's Day this year. Oh, been, brilliant. And, and I was so touched because I was like, yes, I've yes. cracked it. An you International have, Women's it. Day <laughs> keynote speaker delivered by a male. Yeah. This, that, that was a, that was a um, good thing because I just, yeah, I feel like a lot of the movements do need, for want of a better term, maturing. I, I feel like it's really hard to be a woman. It's really hard to be a man in today's world. There's, yeah, there's a lot of finger pointing going on. Some of it's subtle, some of it not so. But um, I do think, yeah, like you said, you know, you, you, you add a layer of depth and holism to your event when, um, 
when you present both sides. And yeah, I was thrilled to to be to be one of those. I even loved seeing Damien Drum there, um, and I loved seeing a number of other men in the room. And yeah, I think it was it was very it was great that you that you had um, a good representation of, of both gender. It was it was beautiful. And if I could touch on what you spoke about on the day. Um, uh, because I, I loved two of the things that I really took away from the day was um, you spoke about exercise, but then you spoke about movement. And I thought the fact that you said, look, we don't all love exercise, but you said all we need to know is, well, this is my summation of it, um, you, we need to move. And I thought, oh, my God, how clear is that? Like, how, how come we don't see it in that way and it takes somebody like yourself to get on stage and go, you know what? Um, if you move, you're going to be way better off than not moving. And you might love exercise, but why don't you just move? And it's like, oh, that was so obvious. Why didn't I, why didn't I think of that? Can you elaborate a little bit about that sort of light that you bring to um, conversations or, or, or the things that yeah. we, we are supposed to be doing? Yep, sure. Well, I think a lot of it, you know, again, I'm a journalist by profession, so uh, I'm not one to do, I'm not, I'm not a lab rat. I don't love being in, in laboratories doing research, but I love to learn. And so a large, I suppose, pillar of my work is coming from a longevity perspective and looking at uh, people from all cultures, whether it's, you know, in, in our little country of Australia or, or whether it's in the backyards of Italy or Japan or America or wherever they are. And th- it's not that they've got, um, you know, I, I run this uh, this retreat to a little Greek island called Ikaria every year and there's 9,000 people on the island and they have uh, 75% less dementia, 50% less heart disease and 25% less cancer. And they don't have, uh, well, they just recently installed a soccer pitch uh, on the island, they don't have athletics tracks. They don't have tennis courts and squash courts, and they don't have um, a lot of you know exercise facilities. But what they do have is a really rugged terrain. They don't have 50 meters of of straight land anywhere. Everything is hilly. If they want to go visit their neighbours, they've got to walk you know along a goat track that is uneven and unstable. And if they want to do anything, they have to move, but they don't view it as I'm getting my 30 minutes of cardio in for the day. And if they're lifting or putting fence posts in, they're not seeing it as their strength workout. And if they've got to, you know, bend around a tree trunk, they're not seeing it as their flexibility or yoga. It's just moving in order to support their lifestyle. And I think for us, we've really been indoctrinated probably by the media and by Hollywood to a lesser extent. And, and these days, largely through social media that, you know, exercise is king, but I really think it's important that we recognize that our lifestyle now no longer demands movement. We can um, sit in the car, in the train, on the bus, on the tram in order to get to work. We can sit watching TV, eating dinner and breakfast and lunch and having meetings and whatever it is that we're doing doesn't really require movement. And uh, these cultures and people that lived a great long time, if they wanted to live and survive, they had to move. It wasn't they had to exercise, they just had to move. And so, um, you know, I talk about dementia being, you know, 42% of dementia would be eradicated if we were sufficiently physically active. That's the massive stat. That's confirmed by uh, Professor Michael Wood- Woodward, who's on the chair of Alzheimer's Australia. I mean, 42% of dementia would be eradicated if we moved. And that's 30 minutes a day, just going for a walk, having a walking meeting, playing at the playground with the kids, playing table tennis with your, ne- with your nephew, like whatever it is, it, it's not exercise, it's movement. And um, it's not meant to see it seem complicated. I want people to understand the simplicity of it. But at, at the core of it, we do need to make our lifestyles a little bit more difficult than what they are now. We do need to park a little bit further away from the supermarket and and, and not, not walk back to the car with a trolley, but do that awkward walk with three bags in one hand and two bags in the other and, and, and work that out and feel how awkward that is because that's actually what the longevity cultures do. They don't make everything easy just by virtue of the fact of their lifestyle. Some, some things are just hard and, and we need to copy that. And And... It, it, but it's getting to the simplicity of what you've just pointed out, which which is so obvious, but not until someone like yourself points it out. So that was liberating for me. I thought, great, because, you know, I, I have been known to go to PTs and I'm not a big gym junkie or anything like that. I was never very sporty. I danced all my life. I was more into the, the arts side of things. Um, but I do believe in movement uh, in terms of just making sure I'm active all the time. So that kind of made me feel really good on the day. I've got to tell you. So I've, I've Well, you've already mentioned that. it though. I mean, dancing is movement. I mean, dancing is, 
there are there. I think there are five timeless cross cultural movements: dancing, walking, hill walking, swimming, and some people laugh at this. And the fifth one is making love. But they are five <laughs> movements. Any culture, any time zone, or like not time zone, like any 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 century that you want to look look at, whether it's the first century, the twentieth century, dancing, walking, hill walking swimming and making love uh, every, uh that, that's they're, they're all common to, to any culture at any time um the, you know if you incorporated any of those five and, and and ideally all of those five into your life then you're not gonna have to worry about missing a 5 a.m yoga class um right. it's just it. it's just important that those things become you know a part of life um but that's easy said than done for many people because we have been indoctrinated that that movement is a, a drain um, but really it's something that has major, major consequences. Um, if it's not, not a part of our lifestyle. Yes, absolutely. Easy to do, easy not to do, right? Correct. Yeah. There's never a good time, never a bad time. There'll always be an excuse. Uh, yep. it's just a matter of, you know, do you want, uh, do you want to risk dementia, which takes between 10 and 50 years to develop in the brain? I mean, a 30 year old listening to this right now who hasn't moved much since they finished school 12 years ago, uh, could really be, um, 25 to 50% of the way, um, through the pathology of a dementia diagnosis. I mean, that's the scary part of it that, that modern medicine is beginning to uncover that it's a really slow, unurgent developing uh, disease or, or syndrome really. But the thing is, my whole thing is I'm no health professional. It's just that these diseases, um, they impact every other area of your life. They impact your wealth. They impact your career. They impact your social circles, your family life, everything. So it's really important that we don't see it as, oh, I've got to go for a walk around, about, uh, um, around the block. It's like, no, go and catch up with your friend. And instead of just sitting on the couch, half paying attention to each other and half paying attention to Netflix, go for a walk around the park, go for a walk around the river. Like, um, you know, where I stayed when I was in Shep for your event, like, you know, it's a beautiful lake to just go for a walk around and have a chat and catch up with someone. You don't have to just sit and, and not listen. So I think it's, um, it's not that hard. It's just about making a few tweaks to your lifestyle. And just rethinking how we do things. Yeah, totally. Like every phone call I, I receive, I make a beeline for the front door and just start walking the streets. Um, just, I just always walk and talk. I don't stand or sit, um, you know, stationary when I'm on the phone. And, and, and my kids and my, my, you know, my friends think it's hilarious, but you see it, they just, it's, you don't want to be still whilst, whilst you're on the phone. Just make the most of it. Go for a walk. It's yep. easy. Yep. Yep. I couldn't have said it better myself. The other thing that you spoke about on the day was about who you're eating with and how are you eating, not necessarily mm. what you're eating all the time because, again, here's the other thing. So that was the exercise piece. Here's what we're eating piece, yeah, because there's so much information out there. And you spoke about yourself. But, again, the thing that resonated for me, who are you eating with and how are you eating? Yes. And I thought, oh, I never thought <laughs> that. Oh, uh, what do you yeah. mean who am I eating with? And, yes. I, and I thought about the consequences of maybe, you know, if there's, if there's um, conflict, if there's, I don't know, there are a number of things that people experience in their family lives these days. Can yes. you tell me, can, can you talk a little bit about, elaborate, elaborate for our listeners a little bit about what you said in terms of eating? Yeah, well, just, yeah, probably I think to give a bit of background is, um, so I run a podcast network called The Wellness Couch, which is just a big radio station on covering all different topics. I think we've got about two and a half thousand episodes in the vault. And I think, I think at last count, we release about 800 episodes a year on all Amazing. different health and wellness topics. But if you, if you even just look at those numbers, that's overwhelming in itself. It um, is. And so I hear all different diets. I mean, I just saw someone today wants to be interviewed on the carnivore diet, which from my understanding, it's just meat, no vegetables, no fruit, no nothing, you know, and I just, <laughs> okay. And that that's even a thing. Um, but I've seen so many diets and ways of eating and as I shared in Shepherd and you know, I was I was a raging vegan for seven years of my life. It was just it was it was vegan everything. Um, but I think the key is that, you know, taking these trips to cultures that live a long time, you know, I, I say like you go to Ikaria, they eat bread. They eat plenty of bread and there are people that are doing everything they can to avoid bread. They drink wine, they eat sweets, they have hot chips, they 
you know, they break <laughs> rules that a lot of people think are, you know, uh, cannot be broken or shouldn't be broken. And it's not even just in the cultures. Whenever I interview anyone that's living a great long life, their diets are never that flash. It's not like, oh, I've been a raw vegan since, you know, I was born. It's never that way. It's more like I've just eaten simple foods and not too much and I've never worried too much about it. You know, if someone brings me coffee and cake, I won't say no. Um, whereas we've become really hypersensitive around what we're eating. And yeah, as you said, we're not paying a lot of attention to who we're eating with and how we're eating. So how we're eating these days is for a lot of people it's in front of the TV and they're eating quickly. So um, they're not paying attention to their food. They've got their eyes locked on something else and they're not chewing their food. Uh, they're kind of swallowing it before they're chewing it. It's, um, it's, and that naturally has a massive physical challenge because then your body's got to digest it and people wonder why they've got indigestion. And, or just How be good for you, can it? Well, it just, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty simple bloke. It just doesn't make logical sense that the dots don't join. But when you eat with others um, and, you've, and you've removed all distractions and all you have is the food and other people, what it does is it, it stimulates conversation. Can you please pass the salt? Can you pass the wine? Can you pass the oil? Can you pass the milk? Whatever it is. And then, you know, how was your day and what have you been up to and this, that and the other. And sometimes it might seem mundane. But what I've also observed is uh, in the cultures that are living a great long time, the, the, the conversation means um, that it's more likely that the, uh, the food will be eaten more slowly because you're actually talking. You're not just sitting there in silence. You're actually talking. And when you do stimulate conversation, um, there is a period, and I, I don't know the science on it, but I, I know the feeling of it, that you might start on um, topics that are mundane every day, but then the longer the meal goes, the deeper the conversation gets. And I have a very unvalidated belief that, you know, I feel like a lot of mental health challenges that people are experiencing, um, I'm not going to say could be healed, but could really be improved by spending more time at the dining table with people that love them, eating food that supports them in environments that allow conversations to be had. Um, you're not checking your phone on social media. You're not watching movies. You're not watching the bad news of the day. You're actually having conversation and mastering the art of conversation whilst you're eating you know these cultures that do it well they don't drink alcohol in an empty stomach and they don't drink it alone they drink alcohol you know with other people they clink glasses they they only eat whilst they they only drink when they're eating so um, the alcohol is being had slowly but it also loosens them up you know social lubrication is a thing um it does relax you it's it, i love it's, that social you know, lubrication it is, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I say that as someone that, um, you know, I laugh at what I did in the, in the height of my 20s when I went vegan, but also became a teetotaling vegan. So I stopped having a drink and, and went vegan. And I'm telling you, I was more socially rigid and uh, I was more, far less invitable, if you know what I mean, uh, to people's <laughs> house for dinners and social occasions. And because I was no, I was not anyone's social lubrication. I was a socially rigid person to be around and um well what I'd were they going to feed you marcus honestly there's nothing left <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, i'm only joking if there's vegans watching there's plenty to eat there's more vegetables than there are proteins and that's what is a lot of the conversation around it so it's not about that but it's just about um and, and i'm not you know i'm not saying that it can't work i i know that it can i have plenty of friends that are vegans and they've got friends that eat meat it can work but for the, what my point is, is it's, it's not, you know, what you eat is not the superfood of longevity. What, it's how you eat and who you're eating with, which even though you can't measure that as greatly, you can't stick a needle in your arm and go, oh, you must be eating with high quality individuals that love you and you must be, you know, chewing slowly and engaging in good conversation. I know you can't stick a needle in your arm and, and find that out. But if you look at the people that are aging well, they have far stronger habits and rituals around their food than, you know, the uh, generations below them that don't have strong cultures around that. And, and, you know, you're speaking to a person here who, so when you say you can't, you can't, you're saying you can't measure it, right? And, and you're speaking to a person here who's a math science person, right? I love numbers and all that sort of stuff. But for me, even though when you say you can't measure it, I, I, I sense that it feels right. You could chart it, really, if you wanted to overanalyze yeah, it. You could make a spreadsheet. It feels right, and, Marcus. Yeah, yeah it feels totally. Right. What you're telling me 
innately feels right in my gut. And I'm a person, as I say, love the numbers. So if it feels right to someone like me, you know, um, it's certainly going to feel right for the people that aren't necessarily left brain sort of um, analytical type people. It just, it just makes so much sense. And to be able to break it down to that, particularly today when we're told, you know, one minute this is good for us, next minute that, that oh, by the way, we got it wrong, it's not good for us. Um, there's so much confusion, isn't there? Yeah, there is. And I think, um, I, look, anecdotally, any of us that have, you know, been to great weddings or great long lunches or a yeah. great breakfast or awesome dinners where the wine's flowing and it's two or three courses and you're around good people Beautiful. and, you know, like you just love those times. I know. You, you know, so, yeah. um, and I, I just, you know, I maintain socializing is energizing when done with the right people. So, and it's demoralizing and, and energy vampiring when done with the wrong people. So mm. if you are doing it properly, you do get a boost, uh, when you're around yeah. people that you love and stimulate you and the rest of it. And so I think, you know, one of the two biggest secrets of this is if you combine socializing with your nutrition and socializing with your movement, um, you get, you, you just get massive bonus points because, it's a lot easier to, to move when you're around people that support you and it's a lot easier to have great nutrition and digestion and assimilation when you're around um, positive peer groups as well. Yeah, and, and I can't imagine what it does to the mind. Just brilliant. Just oh, well, yeah, I think all of us could reflect you know, on times when they just know that it's that, that they, feel they, they feel better in their mind when they've spoken it out, you know. They've, yeah talked it out or they feel more empowered about their future or a bit more resilient about their challenges or, you know, that's, that's what I mean. It's just, yeah. it's not rocket science. Like you said, you don't need a, a research back uh, study to prove it. I think all of us have got enough references in our lives to know that it's important. It's not indulgent either. It's important. It's, it's, uh, you know, if you want to live a great long life, it's, it's uh, not an optional extra. It's, um, it's part of looking after yourself, isn't it? Yeah. So, so if I could, if I could get you to tell me, um, in your profession, your area of expertise, what's probably one of the that you can remember one of the the bad recommendations that you've ever heard? Is there one that sticks in your mind? <laughs> no one's ever asked me that question. A bad recommendation. Oh, like, actually, yeah, what have you heard other people in your area say that you've thought? Gosh, that's you know, that's not. Oh, look, I think it's it's even just one that I've heard in my early days, but I still hear today. And it's really just the, it's the dogmatic um, evangelical recommendation of, of any one thing. I mean, the one that still bothers me a little bit, not, not yeah. a lot, but it's just, yeah. you know, that every, everyone should meditate and that cultures, you know, every, every culture, every time, you know, has had a meditation practice. Like, I'm sorry. I just, I can't find it. Like, um, a vegan is another one. If you've got to find me a 100 year old vegan, that's been a vegan since birth. Um, I'm happy for all of these things to be programs. I'm happy for them to be lifestyles for people, but I just think it's important that those recommendations aren't like everyone should do this. Yeah. Like the only the world will be safe when we all do it. Like that's just not how the world works. The world works on a, on a duality. And I may have said it in, in Shepparton and it's a, it's a Jim Rohn quote, which I love. It's the, the world seems to have been built on a conflict of opposites. Um, you can't have love without hate. You can't have peace without war. You can't have good without bad. I mean, even think of peacekeepers. Yeah. You can't have a peacekeeper without a war. You can't have a mother Teresa without poverty. You can't have a, a Malala Yousafzai without the Taliban. You can't have, um, yeah. just all the people that you love, uh, yeah. you can't have without challenge and, you can't have a Martin Luther King without racism. You can't have a Oprah Winfrey without rape and sexual abuse. Like it sounds politically incorrect, but just but it's so true, find me it? someone that you love and part of a big part of the reason that you love them is because of the opposite that exists. And so I feel like in the health and wellness space and personal growth space, it can get a bit dogmatic where it's like everyone should do this and be like this. And, but everyone's unique, like, you know, gratitude journaling. I mean, do you really have to write three things you're grateful for in your journal every day? Does that make you ungrateful if you don't? Like I, I much prefer that you go up to someone, look them in the eye and say, I'm truly grateful for the life that you live or the way that you support me or the way that you challenge me or 
whatever rather than just writing about it passively in your journal. Um, you know, I love your flexibility. So- I love your ability to just go, you know what? Um, that's fine to say that, but it doesn't work for everybody because it kind of makes, you know, and it is stuff that I'm hearing all the time about gratitude journals and about um, meditation, obviously. Um, then, you know, they talk about the uh, 10,000 steps and then there's the 10,000 hours you've got to do. <laughs> right. So let's keep going. How many other? And, and that's all fine. They're all concepts. They help some people, but we, we got it. we've got to understand that they are, I guess what you're saying is understand that you're unique. We are all unique. We don't, we're not cookie cutter people. Um, and we need to yeah. listen to all and make our own decisions, I guess. Yeah. So I mean, even like just on meditation, I mean, some people like to ponder. I love to ponder. I love to sit, just sit and think or I sit and too. think the, the meditators wouldn't like to say sit and think, but just sit and just, just see where your thoughts go and, 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 mm. and where, and go for a walk on the beach and just, isn't it a type of way. meditation? Well, that's what I'm saying is there are so many ways to have meditative experiences. Some people say yeah. going for a run is meditative. Some people will say, you know, the Dalai Lama says sleep is the greatest meditation. Sometimes you don't oh. need to meditate. You need to sleep. I know, um, I do. <laughs> you know, and that's just, I just, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of just, and I do guffaw when I see, you know, my, my, my Facebook ads, you know, I see, I'm sure we'll see, you know, you can do this. If you follow my system, you'll become an overnight millionaire. And I'm like, really your system, you think we'll just duplicate for everyone. Like, and you you know what happens, Marcus, a thousand identical children. It just doesn't happen that way. So, you know, And, and what happens Marcus is because there's so much of that out there now that we now become skeptical um, in a state of disbelief and then we become paralyzed and do nothing. Um, yeah, because everyone's trying to do everything. I'm like, I know people like we're, we're unique. Like you don't do everything. You do yeah. the things that re- you feel a pull and urge. Like you can't help the magnetism towards the, a certain way of eating um, a job that you want to apply for uh, something that you want to invest in um, a person that you feel attracted to. Like those attractions is like a magnetic force and if you try and push that and force that we've all felt the consequences and, and suffered the consequences of trying to force things um and yeah like you said we are being forced upon us a lot of messages that aren't ours um and we've just got to be smart enough and i think i think we're getting very smart at at yeah saying no to things that don't sit with us and and your message resonates with me so much because it almost, not almost, it absolutely shouts out to me to stand in your own conviction, trust in your gut and go back to basics. Yeah, without- it's like, um, yeah sorry, yeah, that's sorry. How I, that's how I sort of perceive, that's, that's what I'm getting from all of your messages um, through your beautiful keynote, through our discussions now, the stories you're telling me, I'm getting that and I love that. I love the fact that, I can trust in myself, come back into my uh, intuition, if you like, my, my gut instinct, my how it feels yeah. for me, all of those things that we somehow seem to be losing because the world tells us that we need to be a certain way. But I like and that. I think just, yeah, well, we, and I'll say this because I'm sure most of the listeners here are female, but I feel like a lot of women struggle with this, particularly after their children are a certain age and they're, um, if they haven't already, they're considering um, working again. There's almost like some people almost feel like they should be entrepreneurs. And I feel like there's this yeah. belief that like everyone should be an entrepreneur, but really like 99% of people are best placed for their exceptional life to be employees, to help entrepreneurs deliver a message. And, and, and as business owners, Business owners crave the loyalty and oh. dedication of staff. And, and there are many people that just love the idea of the same pay each week, the same hours, clocking on, clocking off. They love that stability of being able to think and then not think. And then the 1% of entrepreneurs or business owners, they love that they can kind of, you know, sometimes never be on or never be like they love the fact that it, they can work any hours they want whether that's two one week or a hundred the next and they can do all of these different things and they can scale and all the rest of it but everyone does it differently and i think it's important that people give themselves permission um you know my wife sarah is a chiropractor by profession but she felt like she was a terrible chiro and a terrible mum. and so she was in tears one night and i said babe let's just sell the practice and you be a mum until you want to until you want to work again and, and that might not be for another 10 years at this rate, just about to have our fourth child that she might end up 
being semi-retired for 15 or 20 years. I don't know. But it's like it doesn't have to make logical sense. As you just said earlier, Trace, you've got to follow your heart, not what someone else's recommendation is, your innate kind of calling and curiosity and magnetism. And no matter how little logical, practical sense it makes, I don't, I don't think it's wise to try and make sense out of intuition because it's a, it's a, it's a non-rational thing. It's just something, it's a, it's a yearning. And um, I think well, if we can follow the courage it? to follow it, yeah, I mean, it's even spooky yeah. to talk about. If we can follow it without questioning it too much, then um, I think we're in for a far more fulfilling ride in life and one that's uh, maybe a bit more dramatic, but a little less boring and a little less controlled and predictable because, you know, we all want predictable, but we also want a high level of variety. Um, and I just think it's important that we, that we acknowledge that. I do too. And, and you make a great point there. We can't all be entrepreneurs and not that we all want to be entrepreneurs. So once again, um, this is the thing that's bandied around, you know, that everyone needs to measure up. And if you're not an entrepreneur, you, there must be something wrong with you. You can't be driven. I mean, it's such a crock of... Lady boss, yes, lady boss, mumpreneur, you know, solopreneur. You know, yeah, yeah. Can we just stop that? Can we just yeah. stop and let live and let live? And allow people, like you just said before, the permission because there is a lot of guilt. Women feel a lot of guilt. I mean, I've got two kids and I am not your typical woman in terms of guilt um, for lots of reasons because of my upbringing, but I still feel that motherly guilt from time to time and we need to be able to own our own space, stand yep. in our own integrity, own our own space and go, you know what, um, you can think what you like. I know what's good for me and my family. And what's good for me and my family from my perspective, if I don't do what I'm doing with you now and that wow event and following my passion, then I'm not going to be a good mum or a good wife or a good anything. Um, so every family is different. Every individual is exactly. different. Yeah. And that's, so we've just got to let go yeah. of those things, don't we? we just got to yeah. let go of those things. And I think you shared that really well um, in Shepard and part of me for um, forgetting her name. Who's the wonderful mum uh, with the young children that's set up the a cosmetics company? Um, she was on your panel. Oh, yes. Um, so that was, um, um, gosh, I've had a mental blank now. now. <laughs> um, I, just, I just met with a couple of them um, today. That was Anna. That's Anna. Yeah, so, so Anna is... So Anna is someone that decided that it was in her best interests to, 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 to work and raise young children and that's what was her calling and in her heart. And I think that's the opposite to my Sarah and I think that's really, really important that given our circumstances, our values, our desires, whatever it is, that we recognise that we're all unique, we all do it differently and we all have to go about honouring the unique and, and um, individual side within us all absolutely and power to everyone that does that um so yeah love that Lo absolutely love that yeah um so can i move on a little bit now marcus to yep. um a couple of other questions in in terms of your life over the last i guess say let's say five years what behaviors or habits has most um has most improved your life, I guess, over the last five years. Is that something you're able? Yeah, to no, I think I think I'm very I'm a I'm a selfish first child Leo. Um, so I'm very much <laughs> of the belief that if you don't look after yourself first and, and fill your own jug or cup up, then it's very difficult to support others. And look, maybe my research is a little bit bent towards that belief, but you know, Hitchcock wrote a great uh, had a great quote, um, Alfred Hitchcock. That is, and he's his what mantra or his quote was, you know, every great movie um, only needs three things, a great script, a great script, and a great script. And I truly <laughs> believe that every exceptional life needs the same thing, a great script, a great script, and a great script. But yeah. you look at the number one regret of humanity as beautifully told and heart-wrenchingly told in Bronnie Ware's uh, uh, best-selling book, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And most people that die with regret have a regret that they wish they'd li live their life according to their own desires and values and expectations rather than the expectations placed upon them by others and sadly many people are living their lives trying to keep other people happy whereas the most important person that we satisfy and fulfill is ourselves and so I feel like that's you know my, my, my mantra is really you know no matter how hard it gets um, whether it's in personal or professional life you know I'm an individual it is my life and I must set 
the best example to me. And then when I set a great example to me, uh, that sets a great example to my children and it best supports my wife and uh, my businesses and all the rest of it. And even just at the moment, just with a couple of things that I probably wasn't expecting, I'm like, you know what? I've got to nourish myself first because if yes. I don't nourish myself, then I'm not going to be able to bring the best version of me to, you know, whatever challenges that, that I face. And, and we all face challenges. And I think the, the key is bringing the best version of yourself to that. So, you know, that, that could be little things and big things. So for me, most of the time, and I definitely not say all the time because we're not absolutes, but I like to get up in the morning and I write what's called morning pages for half an hour. No one's awake. It's just me, a cup of green tea and a journal. And that's just a brain vomit of anything I want to write about for about half an hour. And then I like to move my body um, in any way that feels right at the time. It could be a swim in the ocean, go for a jog, go for a bike ride, do a bit of yoga, whatever um, I'm inclined to do. And, you know, then it's, then it's bed and uh, then, it's bed. then it's uh, breakfast and school run with the kids and some quality family time again all eating breakfast at the table together um so i really feel like that just gives to the kids myself oh, sarah you know so many things have already been ticked off the list by the time 8 30 hits in the morning um and then i always make sure i do the most important work at the beginning of the day that's when my creative energy is at its best it's when i'm most resilient when my will is much more can do than can't do i definitely believe for myself and for many others that we start off the day way more can do and end the day way more can't do. I know, I know some people say that they get, they go to bed when they say to themselves, I can't do that anymore, which I kind of <laughs> like the idea of, you know, yeah. they, they keep on, they, they stay awake until they can't do their next step. Um, which for me is a little bit exhausting. So I'm not that, um, extreme about it, but I definitely do the hardest work at the beginning of the day because I know I'm not going to do it in the afternoon. Um, I do all these interviews like this now in the afternoon. I don't do them in the morning because I'm way too ramped up and, and selfish for a better term. I want to do my own stuff in the morning. Um, and, you know, they're just tips and tricks having learned from an interview, you know, people that have lived great long lives over, I think my main podcast, 100 Not Out, I think we just did episode 325. So it's like they're, they're great learning experiences. You know, you learn from so many people and then, you implement and you learn and it's not just the people that you interview it's it's the spin-offs from them and then even learning from people dying you know like what did they do right or what didn't they do you know what could they have done better and then what does them not doing that all that well teach me about how to live moving forward so um i'm constantly learning again journalist by profession so always learning researching and then um and then doing my best to apply it um in my daily life yeah, and I, I can't imagine you explaining all of those people that you come into contact with through all those podcasts. You know, talk about a wealth of information. Talk about being in, I don't know, like the, the library with the best information possible. Does, is that making sense? Yeah, I'm well, think, you know, I mean, I just feel abundant. like, yeah. 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 And from wide ranging backgrounds, like I love interviewing Holocaust survivors that are in their, you know, nineties and one hundreds and actually love living, you know, cause it's like, how does someone do that? Or someone that, um, you know, whose, whose husband or wife passed away and they actually got a second lease on life rather than grieve for their partner for the next two or three decades. Or, um, you know, people that are, um, you know, breaking records in, in sport in their eighties and nineties or one hundreds or, um, uh, people that are, um, you know, working beyond retirement age and loving working. Um, people that have had, you know, major successes, whether it's in, in business or wealth or health or overcome adversity, just um, there's so much to learn, uh, not in a way that you want it to be overwhelming, but there are certain people that, you know, particularly humanitarians, I think there's so much to learn from humanitarians, people that have a real yearning to just help people. And often that's come out of crisis in their in their childhoods or, or challenges you know but really definitely crises in their, in their childhoods yeah. um that they want to improve uh, the, the the lives of others and um i think yeah learning just just on that topic is something that is individual to us all you know some people love to learn about business leaders i don't you know i'm not i don't, I don't have a great but i love richard branson i could read his books all day and i love nelson mandela i probably oh. love love yeah humanitarian people that have really been challenged by humanity, I suppose, or in humanity. Um, yep. But everyone loves to learn from different people. And I think um, I, like to, I like to pull back the veil of people's success and see what was happening in the background. Um, it's interesting, see, isn't it? Yeah, what the foundation of that success has been. Because there's no overnight successes. They're all 
20, 30 or 40 or 50 years in the making. Um, Mandel is a great example of that. Yeah. He was a success 27 years in jail in the making and many years before and after that. So um, Talk about stick standing up for what you believe in. Yeah, you know, and, and going about it without being evangelical oh, as well. You yeah. know, I think that's the other thing. Yeah. Never strayed, never strayed. I mean, yeah, it's mind-boggling. Tell me, can you share with us um, when you spoke on the day about a, um, one of the women, The um, I think she was 93 or something like that, she was one of the Holocaust survivors, and um, I think somebody oh, asked her. Oh, still in the Shingles yes. list. Um, yes, can you, can you tell us a bit about that? Oh, well, this was around a conversation of the, that daily news consumption um, has, a, has an ability to dampen our spirits. And, and whenever I talk about this in a, in a corporate environment, I always remember talking at one of the big banks and I just the looks I got from some of the people that really you could tell that their Twitter feed was going to melt down at the idea of not uh, <laughs> having exposure to the, the, the daily news. But the Selena Binia's story, which I found Selena after watching Schindler's List, which I urge anyone to, to watch. It's a transformational movie. But, um, yeah, I found Selena and interviewed her and, and she shared the story that after the liberation, after she was free, she, she couldn't write. She was able to read, but she was 14. She went into the camps age eight and had never essentially picked up a pencil, I think. Um, and she and her family settled in a small German village and a 93-year-old cloistered nun, Sister Leontina, uh, had never had any exposure to the news. So in a cloistered convent, uh, you don't know what's going on in the outside world. So this German nun um, had no idea who Hitler was, had no idea about the Holocaust, had no concept of any anti-Semitism and, um, and tutored, for want of a better term, uh, Selena um, in, in, in reading and writing. And uh, Selena had never been treated this way by a German um, you know, particularly in the previous six years and was blown away by the, the humanity of, um, of Sister Leontina and credited her with essentially her healing from the Holocaust because um, Selena went on to uh, move over to the US to study, I think it might have been psychology, but really became quite accomplished um, in, in, in some form of academia. I think it might have been psychology, but had really uh, went on to just, be a remarkable, um, you know, um, um, solid citizen. Because uh, a lot of Holocaust survivors talk about, you know, for every one that can talk about it, there's hundreds, there's a hundred or maybe even a thousand that are still in the concentration camps. They, they have never left the Holocaust. They are still in a world of hurt and pain and, yeah. and, and cannot bring themselves to escape, if that makes sense. Um, but Absolutely. this was just, you know, imagine if we didn't know what was going on in the world. What, what, what impact would that have on us personally in the way that we treated others, in the way that we viewed the world? Would we think it was a good world, a bad world? Because many people really believe we live in a bad world and I tend to, tend to think that that's because the media that they're consuming is only really sharing all of the, for want of a better term, bad news stories. It's only the one side of the coin but there is another side of the coin and um, I just invite people to you know, to curate their social media feeds and curate the books they read and the documentaries they watch and the biopics they watch and the, um, you know, just the media that they consume, curate it in a way because we can these days that actually presents the other side of the coin so that you also have the belief and the view uh, because it does exist that good stuff happens in the world too. Of course it does. I, I, I'm a believer that um, you actually see what you want to see and, there are times where I just think, you know what, I don't want to watch the news because it's all bad news. There's never any feel-good yeah, stories. There's one than, story at the very end. It's yeah, the panda or the, the kangaroo the, the or the cat, koala. Yeah, the cat that was from the tree. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Look, so. Yeah. I, I get it. Bad stuff happens. But, you know, it's like focusing on the negative all the time in any part of your life, isn't it? It's toxic, yeah. yeah. And again, a lot of Holocaust survivors will tell you that, you know, hate is corrosive and hate is a disease. And, um, you know, the Holocaust survivors that I speak to, they don't live with hate. Uh, they live with love and forgiveness. And, you know, when I do a lot of deeper work with people, it's about mastering the art of forgiveness, which is not easy to do. But it is one that if a Holocaust survivor can do it. If uh, the oldest uh -huh. female survivor of the Holocaust in Alice Hurt Sommer can forgive Hitler, then I think, I think, 
people like us can forgive our mum and dad for the way that we were treated or, you know, for the atrocities that may have occurred in our neighbourhood or for some, you know, inhumane act that, as we may label it, that that we don't see the good side of. Um, Yeah, it's an opportunity to expand uh, our consciousness and awareness and um, half the time I think that's why a lot of the biggest challenges and atrocities in the world happen. It's just a test for us to um, really dig a little deeper as to who we are and what we're about. Yeah, and there was a quote that you, not a quote, um, uh, you mentioned when one of the Holocaust survivors were asked about hate and she said something to the effect of she didn't have time or life was too short. Can you just share that with us? I think she says just I have no room for pessimism or hatred. That That's was it. Alice Hertz Yeah, I have I no have room no for room. pessimism or hatred. I love that. And, and hate only hate only affects the hater. The hated, the person that you're hating on, one hardly knows about it like mm. because we don't tell them <laughs> yeah. um, and two, they're moving on with their life they're doing other yeah. things and we're carrying yeah. all of this baggage around yeah make this to me and then da, 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 da. And it's like oh let that stuff go i heard someone say once it's like carrying a heavy rock and and they yes. would say just drop the rock because that yeah and, and it's, know. it becomes a backpack of rocks it's just yeah. a backpack of rocks yeah why do you want you to know. do that and you see people, you know, yeah. I, yeah. I, I show people, uh, I show videos of uh, people forgiving and, and, and like I show a video of a court case where a man that had murdered, I think it was 43 women in the States and, up, and when he was about to be sentenced, all the families were kind of reading in the right act saying, I, ho- I, hope you, I hope you rot in jail, you worthless, you know, vermin and all the rest of it. And then one of the parents of the, of the deceased got up and actually expressed his forgiveness of the man. And I was just, I point out to the attendees, like look at his physiology and just how much, how much lighter he looks within himself versus yeah. just how, just how, how, how just, oh, just bitter and twisted the people that are holding on to this hatred look yeah. and feel. And if you walk down the street, you can, you can kind of view hatred and resentment in people versus those that are living with, a lighter heart yeah uh, look you can um because there's there's a a very powerful thing called body language isn't there yeah absolutely and rigidity rigidity is one of the physical rigidity is one of the biggest telltale signs Mm. yeah yeah Yeah, we we communicate what is it Uh, alan p said we communicate 80 percent by our body and 20 percent verbal or something like that yeah that's why yeah you don't you don't it's like don't don't tell me you love me show me you love me yeah, well, yeah, there's another good yep. one. So I want to so, finish off by asking you some, one of my final questions that I, I, I ask everyone. Um, and it's about, um, you know, we've, well, I've heard quite a number of times, what is ordinary to you is extraordinary to me. So you know how we, we take for granted what we're good at, what we can do, and we oh, think, yes. oh, that's, oh yes. that's nothing. I just do that in my, you know, that's just what I am so yes. I, I see it as you know you see it as ordinary but I see it as extraordinary so extraordinary. what is what is your superpower oh that's so easy because it, it blows my mind all the time so I'm a humble journalist by profession which is I think probably the lowest degree that one could aspire to these days because everyone's got their own platform in the in the old days I so say the old days I, I studied journalism at RMIT graduated 2002 but it was so hard to get into journalism you had to set the jet test which thousands of people would apply for and you'd sit in there and then I think I don't know 50 of us got into the course and it was just so prestigious and all I remember of- those days. I had I had friends that wanted to be, oh, and you couldn't. You know, get a and gig. it was. You oh yeah, gig. it was. Yeah. yeah. So I got I got a gig, and it was a very prestigious thing, and and I remember thinking, oh, you know, and then I did the course, and it wasn't all it was banged up to be, but I, you know, I worked in radio and TV and all the rest of it, and and um, and now I look at everyone's got, you know, everyone's got their own TV shows. If it's on YouTube or they got their own platforms on Facebook or podcasts, it's like having your own radio show. So so a lot of you know being a radio host or a TV host or a journalist, it's like, well, everyone's doing it these days. They didn't, they didn't have this belief that they had to go and become a journalist in order to have their own radio show. I mean, you can just start a podcast. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, but, but now the more this happens, so in media circles or in any circle, when you, 
lower the barrier to entry. So in the old days, TV and radio, it cost a lot of money. You need a lot of technology. You, you, it was perceived that you needed some skills in order to be able to do it. So no one did it, only it was the, the big networks. Now, it's really quite easy. But what I've learned over, you know, seven years in podcasts and, and running events, you know, podcasts is just like doing a radio show. Running events is like having a TV show, a live TV show. And my, my um, work history in the early days tends to be in radio and TV. So whenever I'm doing podcasts or running events, people are still like, oh my gosh, I'd never thought of that. Oh my gosh, how did you know that? Oh my gosh, yes, we, we, oh, we've been missing a really big thing here. And so I am constantly reminded that um, maybe part of my superpower is still that journalism degree and, and, the way, and maybe it did influence the way that I think and research and ask questions and listen and present information and, um, you know, know what questions to ask, know what not to ask. Um, maybe I've got more of a professional filter there because of my background. So maybe, oh, maybe that's my superpower. Well, it has to be. It's it's like I'm I'm trained as an accountant, right? I'll forever my brain is kind of wired that way, I guess now. So you see things through that filter. You've obviously got those skills, you've honed those skills, and so you're forever gonna kind of roll those out without even thinking about it. It's just second nature to you. So of course it's yeah. gonna be a superpower, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and they're the things that um, I even just had someone say call me yesterday, going, "I've started hosting my podcast, but I realise I'm freaking out when I'm asking him the questions." And and we'd done some work together before, where he was a, a, like a co-host to me, and he said it was so much easier when you were hosting. And I said, "Yeah, it was very different being a host versus a co-host, isn't it? You're kind of learning it, but they're the things that." many people just wouldn't even consider um so like you said i think the things that any of us take for granted and you know to all the parents out there that have just become parents by second nature you don't you just take for granted that you can do the washing drive a car do your makeup yeah. you know attend to your kids and you know uh, and turn the turn the blinkers on all at the same time yeah. you know and make dinner um uh, as i think it was anna <laughs> that was sharing that story in shepherd and how she caught the poo in her hand while she no, was on the that was that <laughs> not that was what? hilarious and amazing and oh and my god true. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah, it is interesting. I do think we need to be reminded of what we're good at, you know, innately. There's too. a lot of wisdom in, in what you're good at. And I always felt that in the personal growth space, I had to remind myself that I don't know, I don't need to go and get a, a certified coaching course. I don't need to go and do NLP. I don't need to go and become some shamanic healer. It's like, I'm just me as my journalist by a profession sharing my message in the way i do i don't need to get everyone to clap their hands and turn around on a dime and and be someone else it's i just you know be me and i think that's um when you can own who you are and what your own superpowers are you often realize you don't need external validation or even even upskilling some things you don't need to upskill on because it will only it will only what's the word not filter um uh what's the uh what's the word where you soften something um well, dilute Sometimes upskilling will yeah. dilute your core competence. You'll try and be too many things to too many people, and uh, instead of just just being the core um, superpower that you are. I'm loving what you're saying because you know what? I'm loving this simply because, and you've kind of given me a bit of clarity around um, what I do. Obviously, my my expertise is um, money. You know, accounting, financial planning. That's the platform that I'm comfortable speaking in. But on yeah. the other side. I have this empowerment piece, this self-belief, this confidence, this this belief in women and their ability to rise up and step into their own. And and I, I've always um, kind of clarified that by saying I don't have a double degree in psychology. But guess what? I don't need one because no. because I, I exemplify that. I believe in that, and I do that every day. So if I went off and did some course just like you're saying, I would probably dilute that too. And and I feel that that's a really strong part of who I am, my message, and what I passionately believe about. So thank you. That no I've got, something, I think that applies, I got um, something way more out of this than I than I started with, Marcus. That's good. But I think yeah. it's also, you know, and then, and then on that, um, you know, because I find this a lot in the in the health and wellness space. Just because someone is inspired about nutrition doesn't give you the right uh, and even the legal right to go and start prescribing. Um, foods and diets to other people because that's where you know just because you 
just because if someone loves the idea of money doesn't mean they can start going giving accounting advice because that is a that is a, a special superpower so i think that's where people do need to be um have that level of understanding is like you said you don't need a double degree in psychology and if someone comes along that uh you know genuinely needs to see a psychologist then you know you know when to go you know what this is not in my space absolutely better off going somewhere else and i think that's where we we are um i think that's where that's where maturity comes into it is realizing that you know you're not everything to everyone and there's times when um it's it's very important to uh, for want of a better term refer out yes yes and that is all part of maturity and understanding and, and listening, I guess. And yeah. being intuitive, again, within the relationships that you hold with people. And yeah. I guess being responsible around that as well, which is a, a key thing for me. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's, it's such, I could talk to you all day, you know that. <laughs> it's a pleasure to speak to you. Kids will be home soon, so I could get I loud. Know. <laughs> I know. And no, that's all good. Well, you know, when you've got kids, when anyone's got kids, we all get it. We all get what happens. But um, I just want to thank you so much for your, your time today and your beautiful words of wisdom and sharing yourself and your stories. And um, I look forward to having another another chat with you in the not near, not too distant future. Good on you, Tracy. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Marcus Pierce.